Uh, thanks very much, of course, to the organizers for the opportunity to uh, to talk about all things EFT, and, and thanks especially to everyone for coming. Uh, I appreciate we're getting you know into summer now, and so it's uh, not trivial. Uh, Wei Ming, can you can you stop annotating my slides, please? Um, in any event, uh, I appreciate we're getting into summer, so. Um, uh, thanks, thanks very much for coming. Uh, I should say, I, I COVID only caught up with me a week ago, uh, and I'm not entirely certain I can talk uninterrupted for an hour, but uh, we'll see see how I do. Um, so, what I want to tell you about today is is uh, something we've referred to as, as magic zeros, uh, in particular in the context of effective field theory. The term magic zeros for us came from a, a slight adjustment of the famous Arthur C. Clarke quote, uh, which we've modified to read that any sufficiently advanced symmetry is indistinguishable from magic. Because the spirit of it is, is finding things that are zero for reasons that are not obviously explicable by symmetries, and then really trying to understand what we can gain from that. So this is work that's based on a paper put out with uh, Isabel Garcia Garcia and Arkady Weinstein and Kevin Zhang uh, at the end of last year. Uh, but it was very much inspired by a really nice work by uh, Neymar Cunningham and Kasuke Haragaya. And I'll also include in the talk a little bit about a very related paper uh, by Dela Rosa von Harlan and Pomerol. Uh, which sort of uh, gives a complementary perspective to some of the things I'll be saying. So, um, you know, we, I think, are, are accustomed in the context of quantum field theory to operating uh, with the implications of quantum mechanics, which were nicely embodied by Murray Gellman in his sort of cheeky totalitarian principle, the statement that everything not forbidden is compulsory. In other words, you know, because quantum mechanics populates all possibilities uh, that are not forbidden otherwise by symmetries, something that doesn't have a reason to be zero will generically be non-zero. And so that really governs things like our expectations of, of sort of Wilsonian naturalness when it comes to the sizes of uh, operator coefficients, uh, whether it be for uh, re relevant, irrelevant, or marginal operators. And so uh, that's that's been a, a very useful governing principle in thinking about QFT for decades. But I think as we've thought more and more about the structure of effective field theories, particularly in the last decade, we begin to see that it's it's actually a little bit more subtle than the naive application of the totalitarian principle. So um, a very nice example of that is just provided in the renormalization of irrelevant operators in an effective field theory. Of course, between the scale, the UV scale of the EFT and whatever energy in which you're doing a calculation, the operators are normalize each other and that's most uh, efficiently incorporated into the normalization group. Um, and in particular, that uh, feed-in of renormalization from one operator to another is encoded by the anomalous dimensions. And of course, the totalitarian, totalitarian principle generically leads us to expect that those anomalous dimensions are going to be non-zero whenever they're not obviously forbidden by symmetries and when there are some diagrams, for example, that exist in perturbation theory. Okay. Um, and we've already seen, you know, almost a decade ago now, that that fails in a sort of surprising way. In particular, there's a beautiful calculation, of course, of the full uh, matrix of anomalous dimensions at dimension six in the standard model EFT, uh, starting with work by Jenkins, Menahar, and Trot. And one of the interesting things, of course, it's a it's an interesting result on its own as a statement about operator normalization and SMEFT. But one of the things to me is a is a, from a perspective as a field theorist that was very surprising was simply that there were lots of things in that result that appeared to violate the totalitarian principle. Uh, that's sort of summarized schematically in this figure here, which came from a nice paper by Chung and Shen, where what it's showing you is uh, for various operator structures, uh, at what would look like dimension six in the standard model EFT, which ones are normalized by various other classes of operators. And there are of course crosses in places where there's simply no diagrams for the normalization to take place one loop. But then the areas that are shaded in gray but don't have crosses in them, those turn out to be uh, places in which the anomalous dimensions turn out to be zero, despite the fact that there are diagrams and no obvious symmetries to forbid the normalization. So there was the discovery of a huge number of zeros that didn't have an obvious symmetry explanation. Um, and of course, the, that it sparked a pursuit of understanding these zeros from, from some other perspective uh, that gave us a lot of very interesting insights in sort of the 2014, 2015, and 2016. And at this point, there are a lot of ways to explain what's going on in that matrix of anomalous dimensions. Uh, but I think the cleanest way to encapsulate it is from the perspective of what you might call non-supersymmetric non-normalization theorems. And the basic insight here was that, you know, the anomalous dimensions, of course, are the coefficients of logarithmically divergent parts of one-loop diagrams. And we could obtain those uh, from two particle cuts, in particular, the coefficients of logarithms are just proportional to the products of the tree amplitudes that are obtained by making two particle cuts of the corresponding diagrams. And 
in these cases where we had the surprising zeros in the matrix of anomalous dimensions, what turned out to happen was that when you made those cuts to obtain the logarithms, one of the diagrams appearing in the cut, one of the tree diagrams, was a standard model four-point amplitude uh, that vanished due to holistic selection rules. Uh, so holistic selection rules famously start with the observation that the uh, the all plus or the all plus and one minus uh, you know amplitudes in QCD, pure gluon amplitudes in QCD, vanish at tree level. Uh, and then by the tree level supersymmetry of the standard model, that implies the vanishing of a number of other four point amplitudes with analogous holistic configurations. And so those holistic selection rules uh, actually appeared on one side of these two particle cuts and explained why many of these anomalous dimensions were zero. So it was not uh, a sort of internal uh, global symmetry based explanation for the zeros. It was a, a, an explanation based on the holistic properties of uh, sort of parts of the amplitude. And this provided a beautiful way to organize these surprising zeros. Uh, so this is really the, the first very extended example of finding something that was zero for not a very clear reason uh, in an effective field theory and understanding it not with reference to conventional symmetries, but with something that was more of an on-shell perspective. Um, and that's really been the root of a number of very surprising observations over the last decade uh, that have broadened, I think, our notion of what we expect uh, diagrammatically uh, from quantum corrections in an EFT. So that was a statement, of course, about renormalization uh, in an EFT as we go from one scale to another. But something else that you also might be interested in is uh, zeros that occur at matching as we pass from uh, a UV complete theory into the effective theory through some threshold. Of course, that's the scale at which we compute the matching, the Wilson coefficients. Um, and it would be interesting to understand if there are also zeros in the Wilson coefficients. Now, the fact that there were zeros in the matrix of anomalous dimensions doesn't necessarily imply that there are also zeros in the Wilson coefficients. Structurally, they come from slightly different places uh, as you look at the, the components of UV diagrams. So it's an interesting complementary question to look for zeros in Wilson coefficients of matching. And if you find them and you don't have a symmetry explanation for them, again, there's a sort of tension with the totalitarian principle and our naive expectations from naturalists that's really interesting to, to unpuzzle, okay? Um, so we had a very interesting example of this, a very concrete example of this in, in a beautiful paper by Arkani Hamed and Haragaya uh, just about a year ago now, where they were looking, of course, if you're going to look at Wilson coefficients vanishing in a matching calculation, you need to specify a UV theory um, in order to, be, to make that precise. And so the UV theory they were looking at motivated a bit by, uh, of course, the mu on G minus two measurement, which is adding to the standard model a vector-like pair of SU2 doublet leptons, so I'll call those L and LC, and also a vector-like pair of SU2 singlet and hypercharged neutral leptons, so I'll call those S and SC. So, you know, this is, if you, if you took a random theorist off the street and said, give me a model for mu on G minus two, this is probably something they would suggest because it has sort of the right ingredients to, to contribute to dipole moments. Uh, and indeed this model in particular was studied by a number of groups uh, in, in the past decade. Okay, so the idea then is we specified the matter in the UV theory, we're gonna write down all of the possible marginal operators and relevant operators allowed by the symmetries. So that includes Yukawa's both among the new heavy fermions uh, coupled to the Higgs, but also, of course, the quantum numbers allow us to write down Yukawa interactions that mix light standard model fermions. So I'll introduce those with these lowercase letters uh, that would mix them with the heavy fermions. And then, of course, there are vector-like masses that we can write down for the new states. Um, I should say in what follows, my conventions will mirror those of Arkani Hamad and Haragaya, with the exception of picking the opposite hypercharge convention for the Higgs. The other thing I'm going to focus on, there are two uh, Yukawa interactions in this theory that involve two heavy fermions and a Higgs, this thing we've called YV prime and the thing we've called YV. Uh, I'm just going to focus on the YV prime interactions and what follows. Everything that I'm going to say will also be true for the YV interactions, but it turns out you always have to work about twice as hard to explain the story for the YV interaction. So for simplicity, I'm going to focus on the, the YV prime story. Okay. So this is our UV model. And now of course the job is to go ahead and, and compute uh, matching into the standard model EFT. Um, and there are really two things. Our interest is in the dipole, for example, maybe motivated by mu on G minus two. And uh, there's of course, anytime you're thinking about a dipole, the other thing that you're probably thinking about is the masses for the fermions, because at least uh, from a distance, the symmetries of fermion mass terms and dipoles are similar. Now in a second, I'll be a little bit more precise about how they differ. Uh, but you know, from a distance, the, the one chiral symmetry we normally think about, about fermion masses 
is also violated by a dipole. And so you'd expect contributions to masses and dipoles to be correlated. And indeed, this is a, a part of the story that we always tell when we think about uh, corrections to muon G minus two. So you can go ahead on the left. This is just an example of a diagram that contributes to uh, you know, standard model lepton masses. Uh, and on the right is an example of a diagram that contributes to the dipole moments. Um, on the left, if you just look at the diagram, you know, as a field theorist, you have an expectation for the size of the mass correction that you're going to get when you put the Higgs to its VEV in this diagram. Uh, you should get uh, one factor of each of the Yukawas that mix heavy and light fermions. And you need one factor of the Yukawa that couples yourself to the, the heavy fermions to the Higgs. And there's a loop factor. And then the Higgs goes to its VEV. All right, so that's your expectation. And then, of course, you go ahead and you sit down and you do the calculation and you find, sure enough, the answer that you get from the explicit Feynman diagrammatic calculation matches your parametric expectations. OK, so everything is done, has gone as you expect. And so now you merrily go along to the dipole and you repeat the exercise. You say, look, diagrammatically, it's the same as the mass term. The only thing that's different is I've, of course, uh, attached a, uh, a photon to it. There's a, in the way that we define uh, G minus two, of course, there's a, a power of the muon mass appearing. So that changes slightly what we call the, the shift in the anomalous magnetic moment. But again, you have this parametric expectation just by looking at the different terms that must appear. So you go ahead and sit down and do the, this explicit one loop calculation. And instead of finding what you expect, you find zero. So diagrams evaluate to zero. Um, and the first non-trivial, uh, non-zero contribution actually comes at higher order in the Higgs vacuum expectation value. So there's a surprise. The surprise is that the although it worked, your logic worked perfectly for the masses, and the masses naively violate the same symmetries as the dipole. In the dipole, uh, the, the naive calculation is zero. The leading contribution vanishes for reasons that are not at all apparent from a symmetry perspective. So this is the magic zero that Arkani Hamed Haragaya uh, focused on. It's the one I'm going to focus on today, although I also want to try to extract maybe some general lessons or some things to look for uh, from this particular example that are have, have some broader relevance. Okay. So the first thing you would say is, okay, it's zero. The dipole contribution is zero. Maybe I should think a little bit more carefully about the symmetries of dipoles and masses. And this is a little bit pedantic, but I think it's useful to, uh, to talk through just because we don't always give it the full uh, the full merit that it deserves. So if you just think about uh, a single Dirac fermion, of course, as we know, uh, we can decompose that into a left-handed and a right-handed vial fermion. And we could write the right-handed vial fermion as the conjugate of some other left-handed vial fermion. So if I just take those left-handed vial fermions that appear to go in a Dirac fermion, and I effectively relabel them with some index one and two, uh, then that's a, a useful way to rewrite the Lagrangian of a free Dirac fermion that manifests the full global symmetry. The full global symmetry of a free Dirac fermion is really U2. It comes from rotating those two left-handed vial fermions into each other. And we can decompose that into a U1 axial symmetry and actually an SU2 vector symmetry. Okay, This is more, you know, you, you teach a QFT class, normally you say you have a Dirac fermion as a U1 axial symmetry and a U1 vector symmetry. But really that U1 vector symmetry can, can be promoted to an SU2. Um, and that actually is useful. This full symmetry is useful for really distinguishing between masses and dipoles. So uh, on the left here, if you just write down, of course, the mass term and the dipole term corresponding to these left-handed vial fermions with explicit spinner indices. Uh, and you can then translate this into these indexed left-handed vial fermions that I've written. This really makes very clear what the symmetries are that are respected by the two, uh, the two operators. Okay, so the, uh, the mass term, of course, that involves an anti-symmetric Lorentz contraction of the two fermions. Uh, and so that means the mass term itself is some uh, symmetric two index object. The dipole, of course, has a symmetric contraction uh, of the spinner indices with the spinner indexed uh, uh, field strength tensor. And so that means that the dipole term is actually proportional to the levy chivita tensor in the space of the global SU2 symmetry. Okay. So this makes clear, right, a mass term uh, violates, breaks the U2 symmetry of the free theory down to just the U1 vector because it has some non-trivial uh, components in the global symmetry space. Whereas the dipole term, because it's proportional to the, the uh, levy chivita tensor of the global SU2, it actually just breaks the U1 down to the SU2 vector symmetry. So they, despite the fact that we normally say that masses and dipoles respect the same symmetries, they actually respect slightly different symmetries of a free fermion. And this can be very useful. So in particular, this observation was really leveraged by Volishin back in 88 uh, to write down models where you can have a large dipole uh, with a small mass correction. Uh, and that is clear because uh, you can you know, choose to preserve enough symmetry to allow a dipole, but not to allow a mass at some order. Uh, 
So you might think this is good. This allows us to understand the zero, but um, of course the opposite is, is not at all obvious. It's very not obvious how to write down something that allows a mass term, but not a dipole. And that's the situation we found ourselves in. Okay, so the, the vanilla symmetries, although they're more subtle than we normally treat them as, they're not enough to explain what's going on here. Uh, there is sort of a signpost though, that's useful if we think about the space of global symmetries. If we just think about a, an exchange symmetry, that exchanges the two left-handed vial fermion components that live in this Dirac fermion. The mass term is even under that exchange and the dipole is odd. So that's a signal that maybe one thing we can look at as a diagnostic that will distinguish between these two is some sort of exchange symmetry. And sure enough, that's gonna play a role in, in a lot of what follows today. Okay, so the rest of the talk is devoted to the question of why is the dipole zero? Why do we have a magic zero? And can we learn anything more interesting in general from, from this zero? Um, and so I'm going to spend, you know, the next uh, bulk of the talk really telling, giving you reasons why uh, this dipole is zero. And I'm going to give you actually three different reasons, uh, or sort of three or four different reasons, depending on how what to count. And so at that point, it's, it's worth pausing to, to think a little bit about what we mean by explanation, what we mean when we say we explain the zero. Um, and for me to help sort of distinguish between the classes of explanations, it's useful if a little bit funny to, to refer way back to Aristotle, uh, when Aristotle sort of sketched out, you know, what we know of as the four causes or the four ways of explaining something. Okay, so our question, of course, is uh, why does this leading contribution from new physics to, to lepton dipoles of the standard model vanish when the new physics are these vector-like uh, leptons? Now, Aristotle would say there's four causes or four ways of explaining something. The material cause, that's like the nature of the thing, the thing itself. Um, in this case, the sort of material cause explanation would be, you know, if you just take the standard model, you add these vector like fermions and the couplings that are allowed by the symmetries, you just do the calculation, you get zero. Sometimes things are zero, okay. Uh, then Aristotle will say, well, then there's things that are formal causes. Uh, and I should say the material cause explanation is not very satisfying. That's just the kind of, it turns out to be zero and there's, there's nothing to see here. Then Aristotle would say, well, there's a slightly deeper level of explanation, what you call as the formal cause. Uh, the form that something takes can be an explanation for its properties. And uh, this would amount in this case to saying, well, the dipole we're computing is coming from a loop integral. And that loop integral has some unusual properties. So the various ways that I will talk about that today include something called a total derivative phenomenon. Uh, a complementary way of talking about the same thing would be to call it uh, infrared dominated diagram. Um, and then another perspective is to say that it obeys some on shell selection rules. But then Aristotle would say there's yet another possible layer of explanation, the efficient cause, right? So if, if the form that something takes explains its properties, of course, maybe something made that form in the first place. Uh, and so there's something that makes the form uh, that ex explains things. Antonio. Yes, let me ask you a question about maybe it's naive. So you have S and S conjugate, but they don't have any quantum numbers, do they? No, they don't. Uh, so except they, except yeah, we're, we're not, we're assuming that there is a, a lepton number uh, so that we forbid okay. a Majorana term for them. Yeah. Okay, that, that was my question. What for we you to write an yeah. S square or, yeah. or a, so. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we can assign, we can keep a global lepton number to forbid the Majorana term. Okay. So, it, it, okay. it is absolutely true that in the presence of Majorana terms, the discussion of symmetries suspected and violated by the, the mass and dipoles changes, right? Okay, okay. So then truly S and S conjugate because uh, an internal quantum number that avoids yes. a Majorana term. Okay, yeah. thank you, thank yeah. you. Of course, okay. Um, okay, so a deeper level explanation you might pursue is, well, maybe there's a reason the loop integral took the form that it did, uh, and that would be something like a hidden symmetry, right? If the theory has a symmetry, that of course will shape the form of all of the diagrams that you can compute, uh, and therefore will control the fact that you end up with this, this funny phenomenon in the loops. Okay, so there's also a reason to look for a symmetry, which is a slightly different type of explanation. Um, and then, of course, Aristotle would also say there's a final cause, the sort of the, the telos, the purpose of the thing. In physics, we usually don't talk about, you know, things teleologically. Uh, so this I just mean tongue in cheek. You know, you could ask, what is the point of thinking about any of this? And as I tried to motivate at the beginning of this talk, the purpose of, of explaining these zeros, of finding different levels of explanation, is they really modify and condition how we think about the structure of quantum corrections in field theory. And so this example really gives us new ways of thinking about that. And so the hope is we can extract broader lessons uh, for when things are zero in a, in, a, in a quantum field theory. Okay. All right. So what I want to do now is go through first some of the formal causes uh, to explain to you how those, or to, to convey to you how those explanations work, uh, and then spend some time on the efficient cause, uh, looking for hidden symmetry, and then try to extract some broader lessons. <laughs> 
Okay, so formal causes, uh, we'll start with the explanation uh, that was, was sort of beautifully posed by Arkani Hamed and Haragaya. Uh, so they, of course, observed this phenomenon, the fact that you get zero for the dipole, uh, and they said, you know, at least at first glance, there is no explanation, but there is one way to explain what's going on, which is what they termed a total derivative phenomenon. And the observation is as follows. So in their framing of things, you can write down this, uh, this Feynman diagram, which is gonna give you the contribution to the dipole at leading order uh, in the Higgs Ev. And uh, you, you take a particular momentum routing. So they chose a particular momentum routing. Uh, it's just labels for the internal momenta, of course. They chose that with deliberate deliberation um, in such a way that the integral that you're gonna do to get the dipole has the following form that I've drawn here. It's of course has the external polarization, dotted into uh, the, some, uh, the loop momenta. Uh, there's some propagators from, if we turn off the gauge couplings in the standard model, this is just coming, of course, uh, from the components of the Higgs. Um, and then that's multiplying a function, which is just giving us the propagators of the two heavy fermions, okay? Now, you can see pretty easily that although naively this full loop diagram depends on the momentum Q of the photon, the way that that's gonna enter the diagram in a way that will contribute to the dipole, that's actually going to be zero because it'll contract with the photon polarization. Uh, so you can set Q, the external photon momentum to zero. And then to extract the dipole, you just need to expand this diagram uh, in it's the leading term in the external momentum of the lepton, uh, P, okay? So if you do that expansion, of course, uh, you pull the P's out of this function F. So that gives you the derivative of that function. Um, and then just by manipulating the Lorentz structure in the normal way, what you find is this uh, contribution to the dipole, it goes like the integral uh, from zero to infinity of du times the total der derivative of this function f. Uh, so of course that evaluates to the difference between f at infinity and f at zero, but then you can observe that f at infinity is zero because of course uh, you know, this, this is a calculable uh, observable, there's no UV sensitivity here. Uh, and f at zero is zero, that's less trivial. Um, and in this case, one way to argue why f at zero should be zero is that as you take the external momentum to zero, um, what's happening, the contribution to this loop is becoming dominated or the, the contribution to the bottom part of the loop actually ends up giving you the, the long distance contribution is from the effective operator that you get from integrating out the S and the L at tree level. That has the form of the standard model lepton doublet contracted with the Higgs then two Higgses contracted with each other. And those, the SU2 contraction of two Higgses, not of the Higgs and its conjugate, that of course has to vanish. That's an anti-symmetric contraction of two of the same thing. Okay, because via SU2, that operator vanishes, it has to be the case that the infrared limit of, uh, of this function F also vanishes. So this was what they termed a total derivative phenomenon, the contribution to the observable at the order that we care about. Uh, turns out to be written as the integral of a total derivative of some function. And because it vanishes in the UV and the IR, that tells us why the observable is zero. Um, so it's a very novel explanation, right? It's something I think that, that we haven't made reference to in explaining why things are zero typically in quantum field theories. Um, and it has power beyond just explaining why this one loop diagram is zero. So I'm not gonna go into great detail about it, but you can actually explain why large classes of higher loop diagrams, which amount to dressings of lines in this diagram, you can actually explain why those also vanish with reference to the same phenomenon. Uh, so there's just the novelty of the explanation, some new way of understanding why something is zero. Uh, but then something that it highlights, which is gonna show up again and again in all of the different forms of explanation that I'm gonna give you, is uh, that the zero comes about not because every term was zero, but actually if you think about the contributions to this loop integral in the integrand, um, it's really coming from contributions to from two different scales, something that's localized around the mass of S and something that's localized around the mass of L. And those contributions, you know, in the integrand are equal and opposite in size. And so this is something where the cancellation, it's not happening between two things at the same scale, like in supersymmetry, right? In supersymmetry, you know, the non-zero contributions of the diagram correspond to the differences between particle and superparticle masses. So that's the cancellation is at the same scale and the difference is inequality of scales. This is a situation where the cancellation, the complete cancellation is coming between uh, states at different scales. And that's unfamiliar uh, in the space of cancellations. Uh, as we'll see at the very end of the talk, that actually has very surprising implications. You don't really see it if you're below both scales, then it's just a cancellation. But if you're an effective field theorist that's living at intermediate scales, say above the mass of S, but below the mass of L, 
then this cancellation is incredibly surprising because then to, to such a theorist or such a physicist, it looks like a cancellation between far UV physics and far IR physics. Okay, so this is just another very interesting observation that's, that's worth highlighting. It's very different to what we're accustomed to. Okay. Um, I wanna give you a slightly different perspective on the same thing, which at least to me was very helpful uh, to understand what, how we ended up in this situation or why, why we end up with the total derivative phenomenon. Um, and this was one perspective that we took. I think a lot of groups that saw the Arkani Hamed and Hayagaya paper, this was one of the first things they started to do because one question you can ask is, the statement that the vanishing dipole is a total derivative, that really uh, is a consequence of how you chose to label your internal momenta. And maybe if you chose a different internal momentum labeling, which is of course differs only by a total derivative, maybe you would conclude something different about the physics. And so you can compute the same diagram just with a different labeling of the internal momenta. Um, and in fact, the statement is very general. So although we're gonna do it for this case of the dipole, it's really true in general for uh, some light Dirac fermions coupled to some charge scalars and some heavy neutral fermions. Okay, so if instead you compute the diagram with a slightly different labeling of momenta, uh, you find of course that your, uh, your amplitude uh, takes the following form just given by the feynman rules. And to do the analogous set of manipulations to extract the dipole term, with this choice of momentum routing, I actually need to include an IR regulator, okay? So uh, that IR regulator, I'm going to pop into the propagators of the charge scalar. And so the amplitude takes the form of uh, some momentum in the numerator from the scalar QED coupling, some propagators in the denominator uh, from the massless charge scalar with an infrared regulator, multiplying some factor that I'll call H, where H along with the external spinners, that's actually a tree amplitude. Uh, it's the tree amplitude for scattering one scalar and one of these massless leptons into a scalar and the conjugate lepton, uh, where because this is appearing in the middle of the Feynman diagram, of course, it's carrying the momenta that appear routed in the Feynman diagram. Okay, so the amplitude decomposes into some integral over some propagators times what is morally speaking a tree amplitude of, uh, of scalar fermion scattering. Okay, so now let's go ahead and extract the dipole. Uh, so to do that again, we can work in leading order in the momentum of the fermions and the photon. This is why I needed the infrared regulator because to expand those propagators, I need something to be fixed uh, that these external momenta can be small with respect to. We didn't have to do that in the Arkani Hamed and Hargaya way of setting the calculation because of the different momentum routing. But in this way of doing it, I need the infrared regulator to do the expansion in a legal way. So if you do that expansion to extract the leading external momentum dependence that will give you the contribution of the dipole, then you find the integrand gets particularly simple. Okay, uh, It of course has uh, some form of this integral. There's some IR regulator over some powers of uh, the loop momenta and the IR regulator, again, multiplying that tree amplitude. And it's fairly clear just by inspecting this, uh, this integral that this is gonna be dominated by the infrared, in particular because this, this one over K squared minus lambda squared uh, cubed that really is telling you the, the integral is dominated by k squared of order lambda squared. Okay, so you can do the loop integral and then take the infrared regulator to zero. Uh, and then that, what that tells you very simply is that this amplitude, the part that's gonna contribute to the dipole is proportional to that tree amplitude of a fermion uh, scattering off of a scalar, that tree amplitude at zero momentum, okay? So this is what we called infrared dominance. It's the statement that this loop integral uh, is proportional to the infrared limit of the tree amplitude that appears in it. And from this perspective, the fact that the dipole vanishes amounts to saying that this tree amplitude uh, is zero at zero momentum. Okay. So this is a slightly different, it's the same loop integral. All I've done is relabel the momenta and manipulate it in a slightly different way. It has the same qualitative type of explanation as the total derivative phenomenon, but it focuses the sense on which what's happening, what's special about this loop diagram is its infrared dominance. Okay. All right, so you could say it's zero because of this total derivative phenomenon. You could say it's zero because the diagram is infrared dominated and for reasons that are not yet obvious, that tree amplitude at zero momentum vanished, okay. Um, and then there's finally a third perspective that's sort of a formal cause. It's, it's a little bit between what Aristotle might cause a formal cause and an efficient cause, which is to look at this whole thing purely from an on-shell perspective. So I started the talk just by reminding us uh, that about a decade ago, you know, on-shell techniques turned out to be very useful in understanding magic zeros in the matrix of anomalous dimensions. Um, and so it's a natural question to ask, well, can the same sort of on-shell perspective explain what's going on here? 
Um, and so this was the content of this beautiful paper by De La Rosa von Harling and Pomerol, uh, which was to extend the logic that we used for the normalization group equations in the standard model EFT, to extend that to Wilson coefficients. And um, it's actually a really nice paper because it does something that I didn't think was going to be straightforward and they showed that it's straightforward. Uh, so there's a, a whole set of tricks here that are useful in general, regardless of whether you care about magic zeros. So their basic observation was, uh, of course, the, the, in the UV theory, there's a full loop amplitude, uh, but we know as we take the external momenta going into that loop amplitude to be small with respect to the UV mass scale, that that's now going to reduce itself into a contribution of the amplitudes coming from EFT operators and their Wilson coefficients. And so you can take the leading term in this expansion and uh, divide out by all of the things except the Wilson coefficient to give you a way of computing the Wilson coefficient. So in particular, the Wilson coefficient now is one over whatever the EFT amplitude is, multiplying the low momentum limit of the PV decomposition, the pass through Veltman decomposition of the full loop amplitude. All right. Now, of course, uh, as you probably recognize, in the full Passerino Veltman decomposition of the amplitude, the, the full loop amplitude, there's two terms I haven't written down. There's a rational term and there's a tadpole term. Uh, this theory doesn't have tadpole terms, so we know those are going to be zero. And you, the, you might worry that there's also going to be a rational term, which is harder to construct via cuts. Uh, but one of the nice things in this paper that they showed was that actually the rational parts uh, don't contribute at the right order in the UV mass scale to contribute to the Wilson coefficient. So you can discard the rational uh, terms and then to construct the Wilson coefficient in an on-shell way, all you need to do is uh, construct the remaining terms in the PV decomposition uh, with, with various cuts. And so in this particular theory, uh, the three cut and four cut contributions vanish. And so all you have to do is look at the two cuts uh, of the UV diagrams to reconstruct the loop amplitude or the Wilson coefficient of interest here. Uh, so they went ahead and did that. And so uh, the two cuts that can contribute, so again, here's the diagram of interest, and there's two interesting cuts that will contribute to the Wilson coefficient. One is this cut L, which comes from the upper left down to the lower right. Uh, and so that tells you the coefficient there is proportional to the product of uh, this lower left tree amplitude and the upper right tree amplitude. And then there's the cut S, which cuts in the other direction uh, and factorizes into the product of those complementary tree amplitudes. Okay, so what they did is they went ahead and they just computed what you get from cut S, right? So you get two tree amplitudes, you compute their product, you extract the Wilson coefficient. And you find that it depends parametrically on all the things you expect, but it goes like one over the difference of the squares of these two vector-like masses. Okay, uh, and that's because, you know, so one thing you see already from looking at this is that object, if you exchanged L and S would be odd. And the reason for it is that one of the two tree amplitudes that are constructing, that are appearing in this cut, one of those is odd on the exchange of S and L. Okay. Now, when it comes time to compute the second contribution to the Wilson coefficient from the cut L piece, uh, you'll notice that the diagrams you get, they're identical if you take, took the ones you got in the cut S case, and you just swapped S for L and the two components of the standard model fermions. Uh, but of course, what that would mean in terms of parametric contributions to the cut is that you would get the same answer as you got for cut S by swapping the mass of S and the mass of L. Uh, since we've seen from cut S that it's odd under that exchange, that tells us that the cut L piece is exactly equal and opposite to the cut S piece. So their sum is gonna be zero. And so the explanation here would be, there's an onshell explanation for the zero. The onshell explanation is that it's not that every term appearing uh, in this onshell perspective vanishes, it's not that any tree level amplitudes vanish, it's that some of the tree level amplitudes that appear uh, are odd under an exchange parity. And it is that oddness that then tells you that the total sum of contributions will be zero. I wanna emphasize, this is a, a different level of on-shell explanation from the explanation of the zeros in the matrix of anomalous dimensions, right? In the matrix of anomalous dimensions, you got the zeros because you did the cuts and one of the amplitudes turned out to be zero by holistic selection rules. Here, nothing is zero but there is a cancellation that's enforced in this case by a parity. Uh, there's a cancellation between different non-zero contributions. Okay, so that, that is redolent of this, the same feature that we saw in the total derivative explanation. There are contributions from different pieces that necessarily have to cancel. Um, there's another piece of this uh, that was very interesting in this paper, which is that they, they looked not just at the dipole, but other magic zeros and Wilson coefficients. And in particular, they noted that if you had a model that was the standard model plus a, a vector like doublet L and then a hypercharge SU2 singlet E, 
Uh, the contribution to the dimension six Higgs to gamma gamma operator, H squared F mu nu F mu nu, that actually also turned out to be zero and, and not to have obvious symmetry reasons. So that zero was known, but I think maybe less uh, people were less excited about it. Uh, but the, one of the nice products of this paper was uh, explaining via an exactly analogous argument why that Wilson coefficient should be zero as well. Okay, in this case, there's again a parity that exchanges L and E that tells you the Wilson coefficient is zero. And I wanna come back to that uh, a little bit later in the talk. Okay, so there's also an on-shell explanation, but the on-shell explanation still puts you in a situation where the zero is coming about from the cancellation of different terms. In this case, the terms have to be related by a parity. All right, so those are all the formal causes. Why this thing was zero because the form of the loop diagrams took, okay? So uh, I wanna spend the next 15 minutes or so then looking for symmetries, all right? Things that we're accustomed to explaining why something is zero. So I've sort of said a symmetry explanation, Aristotle would cause, call that an efficient cause. Um, now this turned out to be a little elaborate. There's a reason why there's no obvious symmetry argument. Uh, the symmetry argument takes a lot of work in the end. And so to, to build up to it, rather than sort of hitting you over the head with it all at once, I wanna start very simply with a, both a toy model uh, and a toy model in the mass eigenbasis. And the logic that I'm gonna follow is, uh, we're gonna explore the toy model and have symmetries control the dipole in the toy model. Then we're gonna map the full model onto the toy model and see why in the mass eigenbasis we should get zero. And then we're gonna try to make the leap at least in a sort of sketch way uh, to the theory in the gauge eigenbasis, okay. So the toy model I wanna start with in our search for hidden symmetry explanations is to say, let's again take a massless charge Dirac fermion. You can think about that as the, the muon uh, that we're interested in computing the dipole moment of. Um, and we're gonna couple that to a charge scalar. So that's like in the global symmetry limit, the charge components of the Higgs and two massive Dirac fermions, okay. And so we'll write down, of course, all the allowed terms, uh, mass term for the Dirac fermions, Yukawa couplings that couple the heavy fermions to the light fermions. Uh, excuse me, uh, they're not really Yukawa's, of course, this charge scalar doesn't get a VEV in the mass eigen basis, but those are the, the Yukawa type interaction. And we'll write them for both of the fermions. So there's one heavy Dirac fermion psi and one uh, heavy Dirac fermion psi hat. Okay, so if you thought about just what is the global symmetry of the full theory of this toy model, the global symmetry is U6, right? If I, if I allow myself to mix uh, all of the components of the fermions in the free theory. Now, once I write down all the, these Yukawa and mass terms, it breaks that U6 symmetry down to just a U1 vector. Uh, and so the logic that I wanna follow is to pursue a spurion analysis using starting with the global symmetry of the free theory. We're not gonna use the full U6. We're just gonna make use of the U1 to the sixth subgroup augmented by an exchange symmetry that lives within the full U6 symmetry. Okay, so that exchange symmetry is the exchange symmetry that exchanges uh, one massive Dirac fermion with the other one, the unhatted and the hatted fermions. Uh, and also as a spurious symmetry, of course, is going to have to exchange the parameters of the Lagrangian of the unhatted and the hatted Dirac fermions. Okay, so the logic is we start with a, a subset of symmetries of the free theory. We assign some spurionic charges to the parameters of the Lagrangian, and then we're gonna do a spurion analysis to pick out things that could contribute to the dipole. All right. So we're seeing the extent to which symmetries, a spurion analysis can control the form of the dipole. So if we do that, all right, let's start with what the contributions to the mass of the light fermions could be, okay? The, that's you know, something that we expect to be non-zero. Um, and so if we do the spurion analysis, we see that the contribution to the mass uh, is restricted from the spurion argument to the sum of two terms, uh, each of which can have a log piece in it uh, and uh, a log independent, uh, scale independent piece. Um, and so this is just what you get by, by doing the spurion analysis uh, um, as, I've, as I've sketched. Now, it turned, this is a good spurion analysis because if you actually went and computed the, the contributions to the mass at one loop by doing the, the actual calculation, you would find you get exactly this result and you fix the two unspecified dimensionless coefficients from the spurion analysis. The parameter alpha turns out to be one over 16 pi squared and beta turns out to be zero, okay. So uh, spurion analysis was, was helpful in this case to give you the form of the answer. You can repeat the spurion analysis for the dipole. Again, the spurion analysis is very powerful. It's slightly more powerful than it was for the mass. In the case of the mass, we could have logarithmic uh, scale dependence uh, because we're allowed to have counter terms uh, for the mass. But for the dipole, because this theory is UV finite and it doesn't have infrared divergences in this observable, uh, 
uh, there's no way that we could have anything to cancel divergences. Uh, and so there can be no logarithms of, of some scale dependence. All right. So we know with this spur analysis, we're not going to have log terms. And then we simply get two possible contributions to the dipole from the spur analysis with an overall unfixed coefficient. OK. Now, again, the spur analysis was very powerful. Uh, one thing that's worth noting is the form of these two terms that are given to us by the spur analysis. That actually turns out, remember, we can also you know, do the full calculation. And we noted that for the dipole in the full calculation, it's IR dominated. Uh, and sure enough, the tree amplitude uh, that appears in this IR dominance is precisely the sum of the two terms that we've also fixed by the spur analysis. Okay. So from this from the spur analysis, we haven't explained why the dipole is zero. The dipole all we've seen is the dipole has to be the sum of two terms. It's only going to be zero if these two terms turn out to be equal and opposite. So we've used symmetries to control the form of the answer, but it hasn't gotten us to the point where we can understand why we get zero. This may sound familiar to you, of course, from other ways of explaining why it's zero. All right, so now we've got the toy model. We've controlled the form of the dipole. Now let's promote it to the real model in the mass basis. Uh, and that's actually a simple mapping. So we have all of the pieces of the toy model. We can now promote those to pieces of the full model. We're in the mass basis, so we're not going to get all of the SU2 components, for example, of the heavy leptons. We're only going to get the neutral components. Uh, and the Yukawa interactions that appear in the toy model, those are going to map on to Yukawa interactions in the full model. But because we're in the mass basis, treating V, the Higgs value as small, those Yukawas in the full theory are also going to appear in some cases multiplied by some mixing angles that take us from the gauge basis to the mass basis. Okay, so we can do this mapping. We map now the full theory into the toy model. Um, and we can go ahead and compute those mixing angles, right, to leading order in the Higgs value, um, just from doing the rotation from the gauge basis to the mass basis. Okay. So if we plug in the, the parameters uh, from the full theory into the result of the toy model, sure enough, we find that these two terms that are allowed by symmetries contributing to the dipole, they are equal and opposite. Uh, and so they give us zero. All right, so the dipole vanishes when we map the full theory onto the constrained form of the toy of the dipole of the toy model. All right, so that's good. I'm going to give it one party parrot. It's it's not you know it, it's not really a non-trivial result, right? We knew the answer had to be zero, and we've just confirmed that in fact our spurion analysis has gotten us to the point where if we plug in values for all the spurions, the theory gives us zero. But it doesn't really explain in any way why the terms cancel. Okay, so let's work a little bit harder. Uh, so the fact that the two terms canceled comes down to the fact that the ratio of the two mixing angles was the ratio of the two vector-like masses. And if we can explain that, then we can explain why fully with symmetries, why everything ended up adding up to zero. So to see that, you can just look at pieces of the theory in the broken phase, uh, but still in the gauge basis. And you can notice, so that's the mass terms and then these off-diagonal mass terms coming from the Higgs dev. And you'll notice those contributions, the bilinears and these heavy fermions, they have a spurious conjugation symmetry where you exchange the neutral fermions and also their mass terms. Now, that's going to sound familiar. That was also the conjugation symmetry that allowed the on-shell argument to work. Okay. Um, so there's a spurious conjugation symmetry. And that conjugation symmetry actually implies a relation between the two mixing angles under the exchange of the mass term. So then you can go ahead. We use our spurious analysis to actually just fix the form of one of the mixing angles. Um, and then the spurious conjugation symmetry from the first mixing angle tells us what the second mixing angle is. OK. And uh, sure enough, then that actually fixes the ratio to be the ratio of the masses. And that is enough to explain why we get 0. So that's a slightly more satisfying explanation. It, it gave us more insight into why these two terms had to add up to 0. Uh, the insight was there's a conjugation symmetry that exchanges the neutral components of the heavy fermions and their masses, which really is the same symmetry that appeared in the on-shell argument. <clears throat> you can make the explanation even more satisfying by extending to get all the pieces of the full theory in the gauge basis and extending this conjugation symmetry to act not just on the heavy fermions, but also on, for example, the gauge fields and the light fields. Okay, you can make it a real spurious conjugation symmetry. Um, and if you do that, then again, you get better insight into why the sum of two contributions has to add up to zero. Uh, if you compute the contribution of the dipole from one of the fermions, the heavy fermions, uh, you get the answer shown here. But now we can ask uh, what this contribution should do under this spurious charge conjugation symmetry. And the answer is that under the spurious charge conjugation symmetry, this contribution flips sign. 
but the total dipole is actually even under the charge conjugation symmetry. So it must be the case that this one contribution from one diagram has to be canceled by the other contribution from the second diagram uh, because each one is individually odd. So again, this is sort of a, a very symmetry grounded way of explaining the same thing that the on-shell argument gave us, that there must be two contributions that are related by a, a oddness under a, a conjugation symmetry that have to add up to zero. Okay. So there is a symmetry that we can see at least in the mass basis. It takes a bit of work to see how it's going to act, but at the end of the day, it helps us to explain why we get zero. Of course, the thing that we want in the end from a symmetry explanation is not just to see what happens in the mass basis, but actually just to see, could we see what happens before we broke electric symmetry, just in the pure gauge basis, uh, where even the Higgs value is zero. And this is complicated. The reason it's complicated is the conjugation symmetry that I used in this case, I was that was breaking the SU2 gauge symmetry, right? It was exchanging the neutral components of the heavy doublet leptons, uh, but not actually exchanging the full heavy doublet leptons. So to get something that's going to respect the gauge symmetry, uh, you know, in the gauge basis, uh, we actually need to expand our model with some spectator fields so that there is some parity that respects the gauge symmetry that we can nonetheless use to control the, the contributions of dipole. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to extend the theory of spectator fields to, to make to manifest a full left-right symmetry, an SU2 left and an SU2 right symmetry, and an exchange symmetry under the exchange of left and right. So to do that, we have to take our original model and the spectators that we add are some uh, SU2 singlet hypercharge fields, the E's, and then we can group those together with the S's to make some doublets of an SU2 right. So these are just spectator fields. They're not gonna appear in any interesting way, but they allow us to make manifest a larger symmetry uh, that controls the form of the dipole. Okay. And of course we can collect the Higgses into also a, a, something that transforms nicely under SU2 left and SU2 right. So to explain the zero in the full gauge basis, uh, we expand the theory with spectator fields. We manifest an SU2 left cross SU2 right symmetry with an exchange. And again, we go ahead and we can carry out a spurin analysis. It turns out there's two problems. There's two reasons the spurin analysis just out of the box isn't gonna work, okay? Uh, one of them is that of course, in the gauge basis, the diagrams that contribute to a dipole they include uh, both the S and the L vector-like fermions. And so that means the mass scale ML and the mass scale MS can both appear in a given diagram because there's a Yukawa coupling that links the two. And this is really unfortunate because that actually means they turn out to be many, many invariants uh, with the right dimensions to contribute to the dipole. And you can't control all of them enough to, to see that you should get zero. There's a second problem which is that there are multiple combinations of the mass terms that have the same spurionic charge. So in particular, if I constructed something like the difference between ML squared and MS squared, that's obviously odd under the exchange, uh, the left-right exchange symmetry. But the same thing, uh, the same, something that's also odd uh, is the logarithm of the ratio of those masses. Okay, that's also odd under exchanging L and S. So there are non-analytic terms in the masses that have the same spurionic charges as analytic terms in the masses. And that means that, again, once I have multiple spurions of the same charge, it becomes very hard to fully constrain the form of an answer. So for a while, we thought, OK, spurion analysis is just not good enough in the gauge basis. Uh, but there turned out to be some interesting solutions to this, which you know, maybe if you find yourself doing a spurion analysis in the future, maybe these are some tricks that you will also find interesting. Um, the main trick is that uh, there's a funny fact about theories with vector-like masses, which is you can do field redefinitions in them. Uh, to eliminate Yukawa interactions that translate the Yukawa interactions into derivative interactions. Okay. So just for example, if I took the singlet, the vector like singlet S and I shifted it uh, by S goes into a product of S and then uh, H times L. If in my Lagrangian, I had a mass term, a vector like mass term for S and a Yukawa interaction, that shift actually starting from the mass term is going to cancel off the Yukawa interaction. It's going to give me some derivative interactions, of course, from the kinetic terms. But this is just, a, it tells you you have an interesting freedom in a theory with vector like fermions to actually eliminate non derivative Yukawas in exchange for derivative interactions. It's a lot like actually, if you think about axions going from the derivatively coupled basis for the axion to the mass uh, proportional basis for the axions, it's really the same thing. But it's not a trick we usually use in spur analyses. <laughs> 
But once you do that, uh, that turns out to be very powerful for the spirine analysis because it, it now tells you, you no longer have non-derivative mixing of the different heavy fermions. And the derivative terms, although you have to keep track of them, they never contribute in the right way to give you a dipole. And so you can afford to discard them. And once you've done that, now you can understand that you've controlled the point in this new basis where only one vector-like mass term can appear in a given diagram. And then you no longer have to worry about, for example, logarithms of two different mass scales. Okay, so you solve both of these problems by being sufficiently clever with field definitions. And then you can go ahead and do the full painful spirit analysis. So I won't bore you with the details of how that works, but again, doing this full superpowered spirit analysis, you end up at the end of the day finding that the dipole is proportional to the sum of two terms, one of which is coming from the L fermions, one of which is coming from the S fermions. And when you put all these spurions to their background values, uh, you find, in fact, you get zero. But again, the form of the explanation, we used symmetries, we used a spur analysis in the unbroken phase to see why it's zero, but it still has the same flavor that we've gotten with other explanations, that it's zero because there are two non-zero contributions that happen to cancel. Okay, so a spur analysis is, turns out to be powerful if you work hard enough, but still gets us to the point of seeing a zero that results from the enforced cancellation of two pieces. I should say the same spirine analysis actually also explains the second zero that Pomerol and collaborators found, the zero in the Higgs to gamma gamma operator in vector like L and E. Because notice uh, in the extended theory with spectators, we've added the E fields, and you can actually continue to use a spirine analysis in exactly this setup uh, to treat that second case. And you have the same explanation uh, for, for why uh, the Higgs to gamma gamma operator also vanishes. Okay. Um, there's actually an interesting thing to learn from that, which is that this case that Pomerol and company found, this other vanished, this magic zero, this is not a total derivative phenomenon. There's no light scale in the loop. And so there's no sort of infrared dominance. Okay, so that's a case where you get a magic zero. It's not a total derivative, but both the on-shell perspective and this symmetry argument tell you it's still gonna be zero from the cancellation between two scales. All right, so what have we learned from all of this? All right, uh, I've tried to give you now a, a, an exhaustive set of explanations for why we get zero. Some of them are familiar. Some of them are basically symmetry arguments. Some of them are very unfamiliar. All of them have the case that they explain zero in a surprising way by still enforcing a cancellation between contributions at different scales. And that alone, the fact that we get zero from constellations between different scales, that tells us something, you know, it gives us an interesting lesson for thinking about naturalness uh, and what we expect. Uh, from natural, uh, the natural values of things. And the reason for that, again, is if the cancellation is coming from a sum of contributions at different scales, it's interesting to think about a physicist who's living above one scale, but below the other. Okay, from that, their perspective, the contribution from the UV is some unfixed, unknown UV quantity that they have to measure. The contribution from the IR is something they can calculate. But what they would find is they would calculate the IR bit, they would get something non-zero, they would then go measure the observable. And instead of getting something consistent with their IR calculation, they would find zero. And they would interpret that as some crazy cancellation between the UV incalculable piece and the IR calculable piece that was an exact cancellation. Okay, and that, that would be a surprise in terms of natural reasoning, okay? It would be like saying, you know, suggestively, it'd be like saying that the infrared contributions to the Higgs mass in the standard model uh, or contributions, including up to some cutoff, are canceled exactly by some microscopic uh, UV physics, okay? So to, to give you in particular this example of a dipole, exactly how this works, if you're a theorist living between these two mass scales, you see an irrelevant operator in the theory that came from integrating out the heavy field L. <clears throat> and so you say, I see this irrelevant operator in my theory. I can close uh, some fermions in that, that uh, operator, to make a contribution to the dipole. That's my infrared contribution to the dipole. And so I, that has a, a non-zero result if I compute it in dimensional regularization. Uh, but if I go ahead and actually measure the dipole, I find that I get zero. And the zero, this theorist or this physicist would conclude is a cancellation between this infrared piece and the UV piece. Now, I should say, it, this isn't, at the end of the day, it's not an absolute puzzle or an absolute mystery. Uh, you only get zero for the infrared piece canceled by, excuse me, you only get zero, non, a non-zero infrared piece and a non-zero UV piece, depending on your choice of regularization. 
if you computed the infrared piece in Pauli Villars, you would actually get zero just for the infrared piece. And then there would be no mystery. You would say everything is zero. But you know, if you did dimensional regularization, which were taught as best practices as an effective field theorist, uh, you get a non-zero infrared piece that would be canceled by uh, exactly by a UV piece. So this is an example of what would look like a UV IR conspiracy, even if it's scheme dependent. It's not obviously useful for things like the hierarchy problem because it really seems to have shown up in a special situation where our operators were infrared dominated, but um, it's very unexpected. And so I think it really does give us some interesting caution or subtlety when we start making naturalness arguments, at least as far as infrared operator, excuse me, as, as uh, irrelevant operators are concerned. All right, so that brings me to the end. Um, we have an interesting situation where we've now discovered some magic zeros in Wilson uh, coefficients, in particular for dipole operators in some simple models. They can't be explained by the obvious symmetries. And so this really does violate at the very least what we think of as the totalitarian principle. There are some explanations that are very new, I think, in our space of explaining why things are zero. These are things I call the formal causes, uh, total derivative phenomenon or infrared dominance or the on-shell arguments. Uh, these are really sort of new ways of understanding why things are zero. There's also, although you have to work quite hard to see it, there are also what I've called the efficient causes, some symmetry explanations that use some hidden symmetries of the theory. Uh, even though they're familiar symmetry-like explanations, they still work in a way that we're not totally used to. They orchestrate cancellations between contributions at different scales. I did the other thing that we got out of trying to find a symmetry explanation was we sort of broaden the bag of tricks that are interesting to use in a perturbative spurion analysis. So maybe that's something that's useful to you in the future. Um, but given how hard you have to work to find the symmetry explanation, that really uh, lent, lends credence to what we've called Wilson's third law, that any sufficiently advanced symmetry is indistinguishable from magic. Sometimes it can be very hard to see uh, the presence of a symmetry that's controlling things. But to me, at least, you know, no matter how you explain the zero, because at the end of the day, it comes down to a cancellation between two different scales. And it somehow is combining information about the internal global symmetries, but also information about the states and their, uh, their polarizations, for example. Probably, but what I feel like in my bones, I can't make this precise, but I just feel in my bones, but this and the zeros in the matrix are most dimensions, what they're pointing to is some deeper, more satisfying explanation that combines sort of space-time and internal symmetries in a useful way. And although, of course, the coleman mandula theorem tells us we can't do that, in the last couple of years, right, we've really expanded our notion of symmetries uh, with generalized and non-invertible symmetries that do actually combine in an interesting way the internal and space-time symmetries of various objects. So at least what I feel in my bones is what all these examples are going to point to at the end of the day is a deeper and more satisfying explanation that uses a more generalized notion of symmetry. And that at least to me is the exciting lesson of all of this is we should be taking these new notions of symmetry that have emerged in the past few years and asking if they can give us a new perspective uh, on things that we've explained, for example, with on-shell methods and holistic selection rules or with these hidden symmetries in this case. Okay, so that's where I think this, this should be going. Um, more broadly, of course, this example, you know, really gives us a, an interesting sharpening of what it means to naturally expect the natural size of quantities in the context of effective field theory. And to me, that's been one of the really exciting lessons really in the last decade, whether it be uh, anomalous dimensions or Wilson coefficients, that things are zero for reasons that a decade ago we never would have expected. And we're really in the process of understanding how that works and what it means, but it definitely gives us some interesting lessons for our expectations of naturalness. All right, that's it for today. Thanks very much for the chance to tell you about this. And of course, I'm happy to answer any more questions that you might have.